Bridget Brom, and I'm a senior, like I said, at St. Catherine Academy in Wixom, and I'm 18 years old. And as me and Molly were sort of deciding what we wanted the night to be like, and where we felt our testimonies were connected, we really felt um, called the three main themes, which are identity, worth, and he always pursues. Um, because me and Molly so significantly struggled with our identity, knowing we had worth, and knowing that the Lord leaves the 99 for the one. Quite honestly, we saw it happen so truly in our lives. Um, and God also had other plans for us. He did not want us living in fear and anxiety. He wanted to pull us from that. Um, and he wanted us in his kingdom. He wanted to be member, wanted us to be members of his kingdom. Um, and to kind of start my story, I started off high school as a very insecure freshman um, with very little confidence, and I was stuck in this just constant fear, quite honestly. Um, and I had no relationship with the Lord whatsoever. I thought it was silly. Um, I thought there was no place for me in the kingdom. Um, and I just never heard him or felt him in any way, so I was like, there's no point in even trying to pursue this. Um, and that's not to say because I didn't have a faith foundation at home. I, at my house, my mom just exhibits what it means to be a saint and um, is such a wonderful role model. And my friends, I have the most amazing friends, most amazing family. Now, so they told me I was loved each day, right? I saw it and how they treated me and how they loved me. Um, but it was definitely an internal problem. Um, and it started with, you know, that comparison game that I know a lot of girls struggle with. We look around and we see all these beautiful girls and we see, you know, this girl has prettier hair, this girl's more popular, whatever it is. And I was just like, well, I am none of those things, so I must be messed up, and that's God's fault. Um, and as junior year came along, I was fully obedient to the lies of the culture. And I suffered with great anxiety, um, and it drastically took over my life completely. Um, and I tried to do everything to be liked and to measure up and to be looked at and desired. Um, and I, I always wondered, like, how, how did I get this way? Like, why? And why do I know so many girls with similar struggles? who don't know their worth and don't know their loved. Um, and the one person I blame is the devil, and that is just because he has such an intense grasp over our culture. Um, just look at the church, the social media, we see him move everywhere. He, he's running it, he's running it all. And a few Sundays ago at Mass, um, the priest was talking about how um, Jesus in the desert, his identity was attacked. And um, Matthew 4 explains the three ways that Jesus has his identity attacked. And um, see if you can relate to any of these lies in any way, because I know I definitely could, um, and definitely still can. So the first lie is, um, how can you be the Son of God and be hungry? And I hear this as, you know, this will satisfy your hunger if you do this one thing. Whatever it is, drugs, you know, whatever it is for you personally, drugs, alcohol, beauty, relationships, we really risk it all for a sliver of joy and a hair of what God can provide, a hair. It is nothing. Um, and we fall for it so many times. Um, and then the second line is, if you are the Son of God, prove it. Prove it. And that's translated to today as prove to me, prove to the world, prove to God that you are worth. Because worth is not given. Worth is earned. Right? That's what the devil says. You need to look this way and do this to become accepted. Um, and then finally the third way is I will give you all this happiness and glory if you live this particular way in sin, whatever it may be. And if you believe the lies. Um, and I see this translated into today as like wealth, power, success, acknowledgement, popularity. In order to be liked, you have to gain the attention of others and you have to make heads turn when you walk in the room, make people look at you. Um, and this is such a lie because it works and it's effective in society. 
Um, when the devil can attack the core of our identity and who we are, which is Jesus Christ, right? When he can make us forget that we're a daughter of the king, when he can make us believe all these lies, like he's going to keep doing that. And that happened to me, and that happens to so many girls and so many people I know. Um, and I was telling Molly earlier, we were getting coffee, and I said, I, a thought just came to my mind, and I was like, if the devil realizes, or I'm sorry, if um, we realize how loved and how pursued we are, like the devil is, for for lack of a better term, he's screwed, right? Like if if Amen. we <laughs> Amen. if we realize like the truth, like that goes against everything the devil is, right? So he's gonna do everything he can do to protect us and to keep that a secret, and that's exactly what he did in my life, and I. I'm so sorry I didn't realize it sooner, but once I realized this truth, my entire life changed. And that was when it met Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, and it all it all began one time. I was I was in my room and I was really going through it. I was just having a really rough night, struggling. Um, and I was never one to put on like a crazy worship song, like a Jesus song, like I would never do that. <laughs> and so I shuffle played like my playlist or whatever and a song called Even Unto Death came on. And as I was listening to the words, um, they were saying, in my darkest hour, in humiliation, I will wait for you, I am not forsaken. I lose my life, my breath be taken, I will wait for you, I am not forsaken. One thing I desire, to see you in your beauty, you are my delight, you are my only, and even unto death, I will love you. And as I was listening to the song, I was like, oh, I can't relate to that. Like, God doesn't love me. Like, I've never heard him, and he doesn't speak to me, and he doesn't care about me, so I can't relate. Um, but then a thought popped in my head, and it was like, well, what if the words are flip, Bridget? And what if I am Jesus' delight? What if I am seen as beautiful? And what if I, and what if his breath was taken from me? And what if I am enough to fill the heart of God? Um, the next day, my mom asked me to drop off donations at a local church. And as I walked out to the front desk, I expected to be in and out, like drum off and just dip. Um, but I did not do that. <laughs> I, as I walked in, I was like, feeling this really weird, like, pull and desire into the chapel. Um, and I was like, okay, I guess I'll just go in. And as I go in, I sit in the front row. Um, and there's no one in there, and I really did not say anything to the Lord, and He said nothing really in return, but I just felt like this, like this peace, and like I could breathe again. That's really how I describe it, is just like a weight lifted off my chest. Um, and I returned to that same chapel, that same front row, and no one was ever in there every single day for the rest of the summer. Um, sometimes I went like twice a day, just because it was like, a place where I could be safe and I wasn't harmed and there was no like there was no screaming from the culture to be a certain way like I could just go there and I could be rigid and it was just like just this peace um and I wrote in my journal on June 26 I pray for holy women in my life to lead me and to guide me I need a community to lead me into your heart um, and that was because I really was craving a relationship with the Lord, but I didn't know how to get there, right? Like, I, I didn't know anyone in my life who could bring me there. Um, and the very next day, my mom said it was time to hunt for a summer job because I needed money. Um, and the first place, this is so embarrassing, but the first place <laughs> I go is an ice cream shop, like, down the street. And I, like... I like, got really dressed up for it and everything, and I went in and like asked for an interview, and they interviewed me, and I never got a call back, and I was so upset because I really wanted to work there. <laughs> it was so cute, but whatever, everything worked out. Um, and so the very next day, my mom's like, maybe we should go to Bonefish Grill and Nobody and ask for a job. <laughs> And she's like, oh no, we should go, like, they have a really good lobster special right now. And I was like, okay, whatever, I'll go. Um, and I really wanted to be a hostess just because I like really like meeting people and then talking to 
talking to people? I thought. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, so I run inside Bonefish Girl in Ovi, and as soon as I walk in, I'm greeted by this warm, warm girl, is really how I explain it. And she was so beautiful, and there was just something about this girl, the way that she presented herself and the way that she spoke, that I knew something about her was different than any other girl I have ever met in my entire life. Um, she radiated love and she radiated selflessness in such a way. Um, and I ended up getting this job. Um, and I worked my first shift like probably a few days later. And as we got to talking, she said her name was Faith. Um, and I immediately started crying when she said that because I had prayed for a moment of faith. And God really, really came through with that and made sure I didn't miss it. Um, and as we got to talking, I explained to her my desire for a place where I could be with just faithful women who love Jesus and who are part of the church. And she excitedly told me about the Love Revolution, which she was a summer intern for. And she invited me to go. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, I would love to go. Um, and I just look at Faith now and I want to burst into tears right now because that one sentence and that one invitation truly changed my life. And like, it, when I say that, I mean like it changed my goals, it changed my passions, it changed what I do every day, it, it changed how I respond to others. Um, just everything about me changed because of that one invitation. Um, and so I went to my first beloved on July 12th, and as I nervously walked into the hotel, it's a beautiful property, I don't see the <laughs> it's a house of amazing. Um, so I walked into the property, and as I walked in, I remember looking around, and I saw a bunch of, like, face. Like, that's, like, what I said to myself. I was like, they're all like her. Like, they're all so nice. And they're all so kind and beautiful and loving. And something about these girls I was just craving. And I was like, what about these girls is so different? Like, why are they so happy and confident? And, like, what, what do they have that I do not? What do they have that I do not? Um, and ironically, the talk was about Christ-centered friendships and having women in your life who will lead you to the cross and holy role models. And I was like, maybe it's Jesus that makes these girls so different. Maybe walking with the Lord makes you different and makes you makes gives you a place in the world. Um, <laughs> um, we have a foster girl, and I hear her like running around. <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember being in the back row, just like sobbing my eyes out. Like my, my mask was like completely wet with tears. <laughs> I was crying. And thank God no one in there is like judgmental because I was like a mess. Like my first <laughs> Um And I remember sitting in the back and I was like, oh, I get it. Be love revolution. It's a place where you can go and just be loved, where you can just exist as yourself. You can just be in this place um, for the purpose of Jesus and for him alone. And the same, the same pulling desire that pulled me into that chapel pulled me back to be loved every single week. Every single week. Um, and I now know that force is Jesus, right? I now know why he pulled me back. Um, he wanted me to be molded and created into a leader of the church. And that's exactly what being the revolution is. It's a place... It's a place where women are made through Jesus and we come to know our power and how, how to love and we learn how to be people in the church that the church so desperately needs. Like we know how dark our church is right now and it needs the women of Be Love Revolution to come be the light. Amen. Um, Amen. And I remember being in the back as well and I like the sun was so hot and it was just beating on my face and I just, I remember like, seeing that obvious sun and hearing so clearly, Bridget, you are worthy. And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, there it is. Like, that's exactly what I needed. Um, I am enough to fill the heart of God. I am enough to fill the heart of God. Um, and so, whatever your agony in the garden is, and I call your agony in the garden because 
because Jesus Christ goes through it with you and went through it with you, right? Um, he went through it first so that you may not fear and so that you may not doubt. Um, he beat all those things through his brutal death and glorious resurrection. He beat the devil in his lies and he beat the culture. He beat the culture. Amen. Um, and so Matthew 26 describes his agony as overwhelmed, cursed by grief, as if he was dying. He felt as if he was dying. He felt sorrow and pure agony, and he begged for it to pass. And I'm going to read that again and see which word speaks to you. He felt overwhelmed, cursed by grief. He felt as if he was dying. He felt sorrowful and a pure agony, and he begged for it to pass. He felt that pure heartbreak, and he felt that pure suffering that you feel too. He was there. He was there, and he is there now. And he has never left you, and he never will leave you. He's carrying that cross with you, whatever it is. He was there with me when I was struggling, and he's there with you too. Um, he chose to die for you, and he came to die for you by choice. By choice. No one made him do that. No one made him do that. Um, and once I started believing the truth of God, my whole life changed. I now walk so closely with the Lord. I, I love going to adoration. Like, I'm just so happy. I'm just, I still, you know, I still hear the lies of the devil, but now I have tools and now I have armor, and I'm able to overcome those things. Um, and I just feel, I just feel like the Lord wants to tell you, like, is that, that if you show up for him, he will show up for you. If you show up for him, he will show up for you in a profound way. And he will move mountains in your life. And he will move so powerfully in whatever stage of life you're in. It, it will just blow your mind and you will never go back to the way you were. If you step out into fear and if you step out into doubt, he will pick you up and he will carry you through life. He will carry you through, right, through life and will hold your hand. Um, and you are loved and you are not alone and if you boldly listen, you will come to understand as Peter Herbeck once said, you are God's great idea. You are God's great idea. And I just, the Lord moves through the love revolution um, so deeply. Um, and as, I just want you girls to know that it is not an accident that you're here either. You were, you are meant to be here. You are so loved. And as I pass this off to Molly, I just, I just wanna, I just wanna tell you how thankful I am for letting me speak tonight. Um, and make yourself, make yourself, um, allow God to use you in the world. You are His daughter. You are royalty, and you are so loved. And it is not an accident that you are here. Thank you. All right. So just like Emily said, my name is Molly Knapparak. Um, I'm a senior at Richard, um, and I'm 18, and I'm really excited to be here and share my story and the way that the Lord has moved within my life in the past six months, right, coinciding with uh, when He was moving in Bridget's life, so I'm really excited to share that with you, and um, I want to get uncomfortable, and I want to get vulnerable, and I'm committed to making myself uncomfortable and sharing things about myself that not a lot of people know, and I want you to understand that it's okay to be uncomfortable, and if anything that I talk about makes you uncomfortable, good, okay? <laughs> That's something you can focus on in your life, and we can only be comfortable by sitting in the uncomfortable and realizing how to get through it. So, um, with that, I'm going to start with, um, just so you know, so Bridget was mentioning her mom in the back, uh, I think her dad's here too. But so I wasn't raised in a Catholic family. I just went to Catholic school. Um, my parents wanted me to get a really good education, so they don't know that I'm doing this tonight, but if they're somehow watching, hi mom. Um, <laughs> so I didn't have a great background um, at home. I didn't have anything but the little theology books that St. Francis of Elementary Middle School gives you for first grade through eighth grade. Um, and so I went through the sacraments and I did baptism, I received communion, I got confirmed, and it was all 
something that I had to do to A, graduate, and B, just to fit in, because it was something that everyone else was doing. And so it was just a task. It wasn't grace, it wasn't anything spiritual, it was mundane for me. So I didn't have any background in that. I didn't know the love of the Lord. And so going into freshman year at Bashard, um, I did start focusing on theology a little bit more because it was more of a class that I had to pass and do well in and study and get good grades. But um, I didn't have a personal relationship with the Lord and I really thought it was just a whole bunch of like made up, overanalyzed um, works and words. And, and so I didn't have a foundation. So I was a fish out of water always. I was this weird going to Catholic school person in my family who doesn't really believe in God. And in school, I was the one person who was like icky and not really sure and never talked about their prayer life or how they prayed and didn't go to Mass on Sundays. So I was always a fish out of water and I felt insecure about it no matter where I went. Um, and then beginning my junior year, um, I really struggled uh, with friend groups and social life and that all kind of came together and accumulated into um, receiving a lot of mean texts and being really isolated at school and, and losing all my friends and getting sent screenshots of other people's comments on social media and getting comments on my own social media and I had no foundation, I had no core belief, so I took their words and that was my belief. I believed that I was terrible, like they said. I believed that I would never have friends. I believed that I wasn't worthy of talking with people at lunch or sitting with people or going to the party or just being myself in front of others. Molly wasn't good enough for anything. Um, and for me, that um, ended up in depression. And when I say depression, I don't want you to think that it's a some sort of regular sadness, right? Um, I actually had upwards of 30 absences to the point where Senor Herrera, our vice principal, was emailing my mom like, why isn't your kid in school? Because it, for me, it was so hard to get out of bed to go to school because I was so afraid. And I just felt trapped. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do anything because I was just horrible. And I was the person who was going to ruin a situation and I couldn't go. I couldn't go to school. I struggled to go to volleyball, which I loved. Um, and even when I did go out, I wouldn't talk to anyone. I would just sit there in school and just try to exist. Um, and so as I beat up on myself and fell deeper and deeper and deeper into what is now something that I realize is uh, Satan's grasp, I um, found myself self-harming and I would hit my hips until they were black and blue and that was the only place that people would ever find out and ever see because it, I thought they would never find out. So, and that's why I continued to do it because no one would ever find out, no one would ever see, so it didn't matter, right? If no one cares, then that's fine and I can just be on my merry way and just be alone. Um, and eventually, um, and I was seeing a therapist at the time, um, but I didn't even want to tell her. I didn't even want to admit how sad that it, how sad it was. I didn't want to admit that I wanted medication. I didn't want to admit that I couldn't go to school and I couldn't be this awesome Molly that I wanted to present to everyone else, um, which ended up in suicide attempts. Um, I attempted suicide three times, um, every night in my bathroom and waking up on the bathroom floor and just questioning why I was here. And going to a Catholic school, hearing everyone talk about God, just questioning why did God make someone so terrible? Why did God make someone so awful, so mean, so rude, so ugly, so fat? that no one can stand her. That she's a detriment to everyone's life. 
and no one wants her wrong. Why, if God is so good, did he make me like this? And why he, can't he change it? So at school, when I did go, um, I didn't want to go to lunch. Obviously, that was very difficult um, to put myself in a social situation. So I would find um, classrooms and places to do unnecessary work and um, somewhere to eat lunch that wasn't the ops gym where everyone was chatting and talking where I would feel left out. Um, and so eventually, just out of want for comfort and a safe space, I went to women's group, which is something that I never thought I would do. Like, if you told freshman Molly that she goes to women's group every week, I would tell you you're crazy. Um, <laughs> But I was seeking comfort, and I was just seeking a place where I didn't have to constantly fight for my reputation externally and internally. So I was always fighting it internally, but it was so hard to see friends and fight it externally as well. So I thought women's group would be a safe space, and so I started to go. And that was one out of the five days of the week where I definitely had somewhere to go and, and sit. Um, and so. Through women's group, I met people like Margaret, and if any of you guys know, Carrie Bonar and Grace Crandall, um, women, really strong women of faith. Um, and through women's group, so at the time we went, did highs and lows, and so we went around and we said our highlight of our week and our low light and how we saw God through that. And so being kind of forced to say um, how I saw God, I definitely started to reflect on that a little bit and to recognize um, how he was maybe moving in my life and you know maybe that even though I thought he didn't care about me because I was the most awful person that he was present you know he just wasn't doing anything for me or making me feel loved or anything but he was there and so I began to reflect on that um, over women's group and one day I was just expressing how frustrated I was with God um, how frustrated that I felt that he was abandoning me, that he wasn't present in my life like he was in everyone else's. And um, just because of the way that he, I felt that he had abandoned me in my social situation um, at school. And I remember Miss Kitts pulling me aside um, as we headed back to class and she said, you know, even just from a disciplinary perspective, um, just, you know, if you ever want to, if you ever want to talk about it and you don't have to, um, you can talk to me. I've handled this before. I understand what you're going through, and I care about you. And for me, that was the first time in months that I had felt out of seat and then cared about. And it was life changing. Um, but then, you know, I decided, you know, I don't really want to talk about it. We'll just move on, and if things get worse, then. Maybe we'll talk about it, but um, so then quarantine hit, right? Um, and everyone felt isolated, um, but I really did feel especially isolated because I didn't have any friends that I thought I could reach out to over text. In fact, the texts that I would get back were me. So I was just me by myself, couldn't talk to my parents about anything, couldn't talk to friends about anything, and I was just all alone. Um, and on June 19th, I got a particularly uh, bad slew of mean comments and um, attacks on my character and um, anything from like my body to you know who I was as a person or my interests and um, I just wanted it to be over and I just wanted to stop feeling the way that I was feeling. Um, and so for the third time, I attempted uh, to commit suicide by drug overdose in my bathroom. And when I woke up, um, I realized that I was scared to die. And that's why I woke up, right? So that I didn't, I realized that I didn't really want to die. Um, that I just wanted the life that I was living to stop as I knew it. This sad life, this life where I felt so trapped, like I couldn't go anywhere I wanted to stop. Um, and so at one o'clock in the morning, I decided that I was gonna email Miss Kitts and I was gonna ask her just to help me. 
just to help fix the situation, at least from an external you know, perspective. And it would be great if she could fix it from an external perspective, and then maybe I could feel better internally. And so we set up a, uh, a Zoom call, and um, we talked about um, the situation from, again, a, a disciplinary perspective. But, um, you know, the, kind of the, towards the end of the call, she asked me if I had ever heard of um, BLR. And like Bridget said, that one invitation, that one, like, hey, you should come, or you should go, or whatever, um, changed my life. Um, because I was so desperate to hold on to these friends that had been commenting on me and I just didn't even realize that I could let go, that I could find someone else who would affirm me and help me feel confident and loved. Um, and so when she extended that invitation, I was like, sure, why not? You know, nothing changes, nothing changes, so why not try it? Um, and then, so I texted Margaret a lot. Um, who I knew was, she was women's group safe, so um, she made me feel comfortable and safe and loved. Um, and so I asked her about details and I went to the love it. And um, the first night I was there was the week before um, Bridget came. Um, and I was really just focused on finding and cultivating friendships. Um, and the theme of the night was peace. Um, Therese Madden's was speaking and I did feel an overwhelming sense of uh, peace and comfort um, just for those two hours in Sarah Holman's backyard, sweating bullets in the summer heat. Um, but I did feel a sense of peace and comfort and, you know, not really thinking too much of it. Um, I just went back into Sarah Holman's kitchen um, with the rest of the senior girls to try uh, to make some friends and to, um, you know, meet new people and just see if I could fix this situation myself. Um, and so then I went again, said, well, you better keep showing up for your friends if you want to. Um, and that was coincidentally the night that Bridget came. And uh, once again, I uh, stayed behind in Sarah Holmes' kitchen. Uh, the theme of the night was friendship. Um, and it must have been like 11 o'clock. Um, at night, we were sitting there in the kitchen, and it was just Sarah and this uh, chick Maggie walks in, and um, never seen her before. Maggie, uh, I, I think you were having like an asthma attack that night. <laughs> we were, it was really hot. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, so we get to talking, and she, we share our experiences faith and my family's lack of faith and what I was experiencing at school with my friends and um, I remember telling them that you know I really enjoy Beloved and I like to come again um, them saying you know Molly if you like Beloved you're gonna love Jesus. Um, <laughs> Beloved is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, having a personal relationship and I'm serious um, but Jesus is goes far far deeper. You know, if you feel loved at these events, if you feel any sense of calmness or peace at these events, um, actually having a relationship with the Lord goes far deeper. And Maggie and Sarah were preaching that to me, and Maggie was telling me about, you know, going to Mass and building my confidence um, to go to Mass, even though my family didn't go on Sundays, and I felt like I'm like a fish out of water. Um, and then that night, I gave Maggie my number, like, honestly, kind of hesitantly. I was like, oh, what are you getting yourself into? Um, <laughs> like, you're hanging out with all these Jesus people. <laughs> but, um, so I gave Maggie my number, and I got in my car, and I received this text that just said, hey, I will show up for you. I'm going to be that friend for you. You know, you're saying that you don't have friends, you don't have a good relationship with you know, your peers, people don't show up for you, you don't feel loved by anyone your age or by anyone, period. I'm going to be there for you, no matter what, whenever you need anything. And she acted on those words. Every Monday at 7.30 at the Sweetwaters up Plymouth and Green Road, Maggie and I met for the rest of the summer. We missed like one week, and that was because one of us was gone. Um, but through that, someone showed up for me, someone cared. Again, like with Miss Kitts, 
someone appreciated spending time with me, someone talked to me without me having to fight for that. Um, and so through Maggie's counsel, every morning at 7.30, um, or every Monday morning, um, I began to cultivate this desire for a personal relationship with Jesus. She was so happy. All of the rest of the girls at Beloved seemed to have happy. And what did they have that I didn't? And that was Jesus. Um, and I remember, so I kept going to Beloved's. Um, and then one night at St. Thomas, um, during praise and worship, we were, um, you know, worshiping the Lord together. And I remember feeling, you know, not really feeling connected to the Lord. And whenever I'm having a night where I don't feel connected, that's when the Lord really breaks through for me. So I was like, oh, here we go. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I remember getting an image of Jesus sitting on the altar in the priest chair at St. Thomas um, and just saying, Molly, come sit with me. Why won't you come sit with me? Come be with me. Um, and at first I was like, what? no, like, you're God, and I kind of can't do that. And um, how am I worthy to sit with you? I'm just a mere human. Um, and he kept saying, hey, Molly, just come sit with me. Just come sit with me right here. There's a spot for you. And so in that image, once I finally accepted that, I was at peace. And I felt loved, and I felt appreciated and I felt like I deserved to live and have a life for, with a purpose behind it. Um, and so now I'm cultivating a personal relationship with the Lord. I look forward to prayer every single day. It's my favorite time of the day. Um, and I would never miss it for the world. Um, but I really do want to focus on um, how Jesus walked with us in our suffering. Because, um, you know, Almost nine months ago, I was suicidal. I was depressed. Um, and, you know, nine months later, he's turned it all around for me. And what I've come to realize is that, you know, none of this was an accident. And the Lord's been walking um, through my life with me every step of the way. Um, I believe it's Proverbs 69 that says, The human heart plans the way, but the Lord directs the steps. Um, and so I always was planning away in my heart, but the Lord was, you know, steering me towards Catholic school or steering me towards um, the love revolution or going to women's group. And he was always walking with me and offering me his hand. He said, hey, if you just take my hand, this is going to be so much easier, so much more peaceful, so much more joyful. You can choose not to take it and I'll still be with you every single step of the way, but here, I have this for you. You know, it's a personal relationship with me. It's love, it's joy. And once I accepted that, and once I realized that I was worthy of having a personal relationship with the Lord, um, that's when everything changed for me. You know, going from thinking that no one would ever love me, um, absolutely hating every bit of myself, um, wanting to die because I thought that I deserved it, to realizing that I'm a servant of the Lord and um, his daughter. We all get to be the Lord's, the King's princesses, if you will. Um, and I am just so pleased to be such. Um, and I really hope that anyone who hears this that uh, is going through the same thing um, knows that they are you know, not, Lord, uh, not alone from the sense of the Lord. The Lord is always with you and walks with you and everything, but also um, in a sense of community. Um, you know, I'm a Catholic who still goes to therapy. I'm a Catholic who takes medication, and that's not wrong. Um, Jesus and the Lord pro provides these things for us so that we may come to know him. Um, and it's not wrong that we don't go and get our therapy for we're priests or anything like that. Um, but just whatever help that you may need um, is what he's going to provide for you. And if it helps you, it helps you. If it leads you to him, it leads you to him. Um, and also just that you are worthy of having a personal relationship with the Lord. Um, I think sometimes we can reject that. Or we say we're, you know, we're just humans and you're like the Lord of everything, the king of the universe, and um, why would you choose me? Why would you even want me to come be with you? Like, I can't even touch you. That would be so wrong of me. Um, but 
he offers himself to us as a gift so that we may receive him. You know, if you give someone a birthday gift and they don't just say, oh, no, I can't take that. You know, they might say, oh, how sweet of you. You're so kind. You're so nice. But they accept it, right? So when Jesus gives himself to us as a gift, we get to choose to receive it. Um, and I can promise you receiving it will absolutely change your life and open a thousand doors that you never even thought would be open for you. And I just really appreciate um, all the, especially um, the moms who have come out tonight and, you know, maybe listen to this uncomfortable conversation about, you know, what 15, 16, 18-year-old girls are going through. Um, and I just thank you for letting me share my story. And I hope that it changes your heart and opens your um, mind to what's out there in the world, but then um, to also see the Savior that's uh, waiting for all of us. So thank you.